Hello. Hi, Joe. How you going, Gracie? Oh, I'm, I'm going. I'm moving. <laughs> How about yourself? Same here. Uh, you know, as good as quarantine can get. Uh, just, um, just trying to make do with the best and uh, uh, still keeping busy, which is good. That's good. I got my buddy here, Joe Monzo, Monzo Production. He's the best in the world in my eyes. So I'm your walking billboard. <laughs> there you go. I appreciate that. How have you been keeping yourself busy? So um, it's interesting. We actually had a, quite a lot of filming right before the pandemic happened. Uh huh. So, we so right when kind of like the lockdowns and the uh the travel bans kicked in to me it was more like all right well we still have projects to edit so it's still it was still kind of business as usual for a little bit yeah um we had a couple shoots that got postponed um but for the most part we were just still kind of in editing phase uh and then we had a couple of our school clients uh, as they were trying to make that pivot, um, they're like, all right, you know, how are we going to keep the social media content positive? Right. Uh, so in that regards, we did a lot of repurposing footage from previously shot, uh, uh days. Nice. And kind of repurposing them for like, for like virtual tours or, um, or kind of super short inter. Oh, Joe, can you hear me? You have a, hello? Did you lose me? Yeah, you got really bad connection there. Oh, geez. I hope. Hold on. Let's see here. All right. How about now? Is it better? Can you see uh, me? Well, we'll see if you. I can definitely see you. Is you freezing <laughs> up? <laughs> so we'll see if you freeze up again. <laughs> yeah. Well, as long as people can hear me, right? Uh. Well, I'm losing audio, and then also there's a freeze factor too. So we'll see what happens. Okay, sounds good. If uh, wor worst comes to worst, I can always potentially relocate to a different spot. But this is actually my office per se, so I try not to. I try not to leave because you know the rest of the place isn't as quite as uh, clean. <laughs> Presentable. <laughs> You're back. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, one thing I like about you, Joe, well, I mean, among others. There's so many different reasons why I like you, respect you, and admire you. But uh, one of the many is that uh, you're a hustler, but you do it with such great grace. You know, you don't come across as, you know, anxious and overbearing, um, but you're always hustling. You're always out there um, keeping yourself relevant with your existing clients, and you need to be able to do that. Um, not everybody has been fortunate to have their clients trust or rely on them to help them through this, um, this virus situation. So you're very fortunate to have those, uh, the dynamics of your relationships, the way you do with your clients, to be able to say, hey, here's how I can help you, and they take it and run with it, you know, because most people are sitting there going, no, we have to hold on to our money. I'm one of them. But at the same time, I have been spending money because I have no choice but to pivot and figure out how to keep us and everybody's, you know, right in their view, to keep my brand in their view, as well as to keep us, you know, relevant in the market and stuff. So, you know, kudos to you for that. You know, it's, it's not easy right now. It's, it's even tougher than, than a norm. Yeah, well, thank you. I really appreciate those words. And it's, you know, uh, it's something where, you know, I, I always try to keep a positive outlook. Um, you know, I have some some very positive supporting colleagues and, and mentors. And I think that's been a pretty big piece of kind of what's keeping me forward. I mean, there have been some times during this pandemic where we're like, you know, where I'm just like, what is going to happen next? Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, well, how can you predict something that, you know, and, and like, how can you predict it? All you can really do, I think, is really just be kind of on the balls of your feet and yeah. just be prepared to kind of make those, sh those shifts and pivots when need to. 
Um, being flexible. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just being flexible. Yeah, you know, one of the key things that I feel as though a lot of small business owners or entrepreneurs, uh, where they fail at or make their mistakes at, is if they have a business plan in place, they are walking a fine line based on the guidance of that business plan and the way it was written or directed for them. Um, and I've learned this very early on when I first started my business, you need to flow with what's going on with the economy and what's going on with your industry. And sometimes being flexible and being able to, to uh, switch up a little bit um, can be in your favor just as much as it can be against you based on your business plan. And just because you are drifting a little bit in this direction or maybe swaying over a little bit in this direction, you're still moving forward. It's mm -hmm. not a straight line. And so, so you're still getting to the point where you need to be. Yeah. And I, you know, that's interesting. Uh, one of my mentors have, have told me this before and, you know, obviously have kind of like a general roadmap, but, uh, but at the same time, you kind of just want to be like water. You just want to just go with the flow because you are still moving forward. You yeah. know, whether that's, you know, you, you try a different thing, uh, you, you know, and that kind of goes in the, in the, in the field of fail fast. So like, you know, if something's working, you know, great. Um, but if you see that it's not working, you know, it'd be like, all right, you know what? It didn't yeah. work out. We weren't interested in it, but at least you're kind of learning from that. Um, Absolutely. And that's true. spoken from the, uh, that's spoken from a true entrepreneur. There's a lot of people in business that are not risk takers. If you are an entrepreneur or a business person of any sort, no matter how big and small you are, you have to be willing to take risk. Not all of your business decisions are going to be lucrative for you. Those are learning curves. And you just know and you learn when to take those risks and when not to take those risks um, you know, so freely. I was spending money like crazy in the very beginning. And I had a very um, dear friend of mine say to me, Gracie, keep your overhead costs very low because before you know it, you're gonna realize all your money is gone. And I was like, ooh. So I kind of sort of took his advice on a lot of things, but not everything. And that money was flying really quick. It was going out a lot quicker than it was coming in. So I had to strap up and I had to be a lot more uh, selective about how much I spent on certain things and really investing in other things. Um, and it's always a learning curve. No matter how long you be, you're in business for, you're going to always have something to learn and to experience from your growth on what's worth it and what's not. And one of the biggest things that people make mistakes on is the marketing, the value of their marketing and doing it the right way. You can't be cheap on that. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's super important. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, what's interesting, at, you know, about, you know, in this whole thing is, um, you know, a lot of like the ad spend, if you know, like if you're paying for Facebook ads or, or Google ads, they're actually at a pretty low cost per click right now because you know a lot of people are pulling back on their on their marketing dollars. So if you you know if you normally do spend money on on Facebook or Google ads or you know or any kind of online ads, you know it's it's actually probably still a really good time to to keep at it. Um, even if you can't really conduct business, there's still ways that you can you know keep providing value. Um, because again, you know, if you're, you know, if you, if you are a small business owner, you, you really should be kind of thinking this in the long haul. I mean, I think of, you know, like what, when I do my postings on LinkedIn, it's not meant for an immediate sale, but right. what happens is my network sees my post, they see the consistency and then they're like, you know, all right, you know, so maybe like, you know, six months to a year down the line, they either bring me on for a project or. I'm still top of mind. And if they're talking to someone else saying like, Oh, I know a guy, he's always posting stuff. And so I'm yeah. top of mind. So it's super important. Um, you know, as, as, as difficult as it might be, it's uh -huh. super important to find a way to make it happen. And it doesn't have to be spending, you know, 
you know, a crazy amount of money, but, you know, still something to help keep you top of mind. Absolutely. 100%. How do you feel the value of events and meetings more so now that we have this restriction for social gathering? How do you feel as though that impacts a lot of businesses? Yeah. So, um, the, the, there will certainly be a struggle with the, you know, um, uh, in terms of events, there's going to be a struggle with, you know, how do you get people excited about an, about a virtual event? Um, you know, virtual events are great, but I think there is something where, you know, we as humans, we like to, you know, to be in a place where, you know, it's, you know, if you're at this big conference, you know, you're at this, you know, your eyes are going like, whoa, this is so cool. Yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, so that's certainly a struggle, but, um, you know, I think part of it also is, um, with everyone's mindset of like, you know, all right, we're all in this together. Um, and really kind of honing down on what the content being presented is about, right. you know, in a way you're able to kind of focus a little bit more on that. So, and you know, you might be looking at a presenter at like a normal event and you'll be like, Oh my God, you know, I love that. You know, I love that person's code or something random like that or, yeah. or whatever. It is. Um, and, but now you're just like, you're just honed in on the actual, uh, the actual content and so with that you might be able to to, to, di to digest some of the information better yeah I, I agree 100% um, I was using this um, analogy with someone the other day it was probably my husband and um, oh no it was a relative of mine I was talking to to my aunt and uh, we're in the process of going into our new home where you know we're, we're building a home throughout all this crisis <laughs> Um, so she says to me, are you ready for this? And um, she says, did you really, she says, I know you were shopping for furniture and all this kind of stuff. Did you start purchasing and all that stuff? I kind of halted with it is what I told her. And I said, I'd rather just physically get us into this new house safely without being contaminated with right. the virus. Um, because obviously we have to hire people to help us out and stuff. Um, and I said, and then once we're physically in the house with, what we already have with us in this temporary location anything that we need to buy new we'll take our time and get to that and i said because personally we talked about online shopping i said i don't care for shopping for everything online i need to touch see and feel <laughs> what i'm getting my couch i want to touch see feel and maybe sit on it and lay on it to make sure it's the right quality and the right comfort for my home and stuff there's certain things i just can't buy online you know i i've known for years people say i can't shop for clothes and shoes online but now they're crazy about that i just have my limitations in certain areas like that and i own a a online boutique store but you know i need to be able to put it on and try it out and say okay this works for me you know, everything doesn't look good on somebody else's body or on a rack. But yeah. um, I feel as though the events is the same thing. You need to be there physically. And mm -hmm. I feel as though, you know, I don't know what your thoughts are about this, but I feel as though because of this virus, people are able to see the value of events mm -hmm. or whatever activities, whether it's a meeting or event of any sort, more than ever for their company. They didn't realize how important and what a great asset it was to them until now, as well yeah. as part of it. You don't realize what you have until you don't have it, is what yep. they say. <laughs> That's right. And it's so funny because I was um, chatting with another person yesterday, another business associate, and I said, you know, prior to this virus, I always heard people say, well, we don't really do events. Yes, you do. If you have a business, even if you're a speaker, if you're just a speaker, you're a one man show, you have a purpose and a need for events. You're doing speaking engagements, you're booking these speaking yeah. engagements, you're doing virtual meetings you because you want to consult with your clients if you're booking um one-on-one -on -one sessions 
you have a pur a purpose for event planners and stuff. But um, I I just want people to realize the value of not only events but the marketing component too, uh, because too often do we see clients or people turning down budget or taking a very cheap approach to it and you you can't you can't cut corners on those you can't cut corners on websites and you can't cut corners on marketing yeah and it's you know it's it's sometimes uh they don't really see it until they you know and until they experience it um you know I, i've had a couple the benefit of it yeah exactly and you know i've, I've had a couple of colleagues of mine where you know, at least on the website side of things, you know, they kind of go the cheap route and then all of a sudden their website's hacked and it was, you know, hacked in a very embarrassing way. We'll just put it that way. Yeah. Um, so now they're like, okay, now I actually need to get, you know, like a professional web developer, you know, handle security and all that stuff. Um, it's almost like its own form of insurance, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, and my question is, why lose that money? Why lose that money? Because it doesn't make business sense to me. You're spending a tiny portion of your money taking the cheaper route. Then when you have a crisis, like your website being hacked in, now you got to spend the money to undo that damage. And then you got to turn around and spend the right amount of money to get the right expert to do it for you that way. So you've been charged how much money? much more than what you would have paid originally had you done it the right way the first time. <laughs> I call them blind spots and it, it happens to everyone. Um, you know, we've all probably been in that position, whether it was for marketing or whether it's for operations or, or something yeah. along those lines. Um, but you know, that's just kind of where the blind spots kind of kick in. And, uh, you know, we just always have to be cautious about it. And, and yeah. sometimes, like, you know, how much would it cost me to not do this? Yeah. Um, there was a great, a great video I saw online about, um, about, you know, pricing for like logo and branding and they used the Nike example mm -hmm. and the Nike logo was, you know, it was a very simple design. Mm -hmm. Um, it actually, I believe it only cost, you know, the owner like 35 bucks, but you know, if you think about it, that logo is, is everywhere. It's on the website. It's on, it's on pamphlets. It's on, you know, it's on shirts. It's, it's everywhere. Right. So what would be the cost if suddenly that logo became something where it was like, it didn't work. Now, while you might not have lost a lot of money up front to make the logo, you have to spend all this money to reprint all of that logo assets. That's um, right. And you know, that, that itself could just be enormous. Oh yes, don't I know that we I five years ago we rebranded ourselves and uh we had no choice but to do it. Uh long story, but um it took not only a lot of money to do all those changes, had to redo all our branding, redo the website, redo all our social media, we lost our followers on our social media platforms because we had to redo everything. We lost the connection of the people to the, the, the first brand. And while we're doing all of this, we're losing time. And when, when you lose time, you're losing money. Yeah. Time is yeah. money and money is time. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, we never touched on what it is that you do. Uh, tell me a little bit about the business so that people yeah. can understand what we're talking about here. Yeah, for sure. So um, Monzo Media Productions is a video production company and we focus on crafting compelling videos for schools, nonprofits, and businesses. Um, and we really, we really tackle it in a way where it's gonna help drive engagement through the video and to be able to get the help with the bottom line um, so one of the things that kind of makes us different is, you know, we're not just going to, you know, hand you a pretty video and be like, peace out. We're going to, you know, help guide yeah. you through how to properly market the videos, um, right. because that's half the battle, uh, mm -hmm. at least through like the organic sense. Um, so that's a pretty big piece of differentiator for us. Um, and, you know, as of recently, you know, we've been doing more work with schools and, and whatnot. So 
another differentiator and that realm is you know I, I was I was able to go to a private school myself and so I, I'm able to kind of think and see as as a student as a family uh, you know how you know how prospective families are thinking you know how are you going to try to capture this you know this this whole school culture and all that stuff um, but that's really kind of what we do in a nutshell and it's uh, you know we've been in business for about five years, four years, um, somewhere ar around those lines, unofficially or officially. Um, uh -huh. It's been, uh, you know, and it's been, it, it, it's been a great journey and a great experience. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm totally in this for the long haul. Awesome. That's awesome. So what made you decide to get into it? What was your drive to going into this field as well as being a business owner? So, yeah, that's a great question. It's, uh, it's so funny because I, um, you know, I actually, it, it was weird because in college I took zero business classes. I wanted nothing to do with any business or PR or marketing. I felt the whole thing was a scam. Um, and then eventually towards the end of my college career, I, you know, I, I got an internship with a software company doing like a lot of like their video editing. Um, you know, so it was, you know, it was, it was all right, you know, it wasn't anything fancy per se. I had a couple of really cool, cool opportunities to fly out to California to, to do some filming for them, which wow. was fun. Um, but uh, but for the most part, you know, I was doing a lot of the editing at home. Um, and then I was like, all right, you know, there's got to be a way to kind of you know create something that's engaging for for the business community because it seemed like that's where I was going. I didn't want to take the Hollywood route. Yeah. Um, and. And trying to and trying to get a full time job in, in, in the videography profession is very difficult because uh, they kind of want you to know all the skills under the sun for you know a, a cheap amount. The, you know, so the value was definitely uh, what they were willing to pay was not there. Uh -huh. um, and then you got to follow by their <laughs> follow their rules per se. Not that I'm a rule breaker or anything. No, you're but, not. Like, I can vouch for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's definitely ways where like you know i like to keep things organized and stuff like that um so then i was like all right you know i guess we'll give this whole business thing a try um and like anything else you know there's a lot of trial and errors and uh you know i, I stuck with the business route so i was doing mostly small businesses and a couple of corporate clients um and then uh around 2017 i decided that's when I was going to do more work with like the schools and nonprofits after doing a video for my own high school, right. um, which was a great experience. And uh, uh, from there, just really kind of pushing more for, for other private schools. And, you know, we'll still do work for some businesses for yeah. sure. We still have some great business clients, um, you know, that we love doing work for. And, you know, part of me is like, you know, I'd almost rather work with the right person than the right industry per se. Right. Um, because you know i've had situations where like i go into like a meeting or or something like that i'm just like oh man this person you know, you know like this, it's a weird industry you know i don't know if i want to be a part of it but we have such great connections and we we totally get along and right. you know they understand the value and uh you know the projects go out without a hitch and it's been, they're going to be easy to work with <laughs> yeah so for me that's a big you know that uh, that's a big thing i've had my my fair share of um uh, of, of, of clients who are difficult, you know, quote unquote, um, you know, but it doesn't happen very often, luckily, these days. Good, um, that's good. You know how to really, um, what you call it, screen your clients, you know? It seems like you're vetting them out um, appropriately, which is important and stuff. Um, most business companies or small business owners like you and I, I find are doing that more and more. Um, they're coming to realize that they don't have to take every single job that comes their way. They can they can turn down work just to be true to their brand. I personally do it to be true to my brand. I don't take every um, every opportunity that comes our way, and some of it is for the same reasons that you've mentioned. But a lot of it is to is to stay focused on what who we say we are and to be able to continue to produce the level of work and quality that we say we can produce. We can't do that if people are asking us to do um, certain projects that's below our standards um, and then at the same time be nickel and dime for it, you know? So 
it's, it's just not a good fit or whatever. Yeah. Which brings me to another case. Um, what's your experience been like with uh, clients, uh, especially now with the coronavirus? Do you feel as though that people have uh, high expectations for your work, but not the fee and paying you? Um, you know, that's a really great question. And, you know, there has been, you know, kind of internal discussions in terms of, you know, how do you, how do you put in the value um, or how do you price the value, even though, you know, the quality of work, like, you know, I, I've had a couple of my clients send, you know, some iPhone, smartphone type shop um, and, you know, I'll, I'll just piece it together mm -hmm. and you, know, you can only do so much with it. Right. But it's still a pretty big value. Um, so we had a, uh, you know, like a client who, um, you know, they were about to do like a big sales presentation for a very big company. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because I didn't really even think about this till afterwards. But like, you know, we did a little, um, you know, it, it probably only took me a couple hours to piece together, maybe, you know, a half hour to an hour to to do the consultation on like, you know, here's how you should film with your phone, you know, make sure you do it this way, not that way, and that right. kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things, you know, where like, you know, I really only charge, you know, I, I charge probably like 80% less than what I normally would for a typical, you know, we go out and shoot the, the thing and we, you know, we make something as nice as we can, but um, it's one of those things where like, you know, when you're kind of stuck in this, you know, in this environment, it's like, you know, all right, you, you kind of have, and you also want to be budget conscious of people who are, you know, who, who might be struggling in these times. Yeah. Um, and so part of me is like, you know, wow, if, 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 if they had actually gotten that sale and that video helped, you know, the, their cost per acquisition really went, lo really went down. Yeah. And that's, and that's a challenge for me in terms of like, you know, how are you providing value? Um, and so I think, a lot of things that a lot of videographers and video production companies are going to have to do is, you know, not, not to differentiate themselves through their work. Their work should already be good. There shouldn't be any, um, there shouldn't be any reason why it's not, you know, and, and if it's not good, then, you know, you gotta, well, I don't want to say move on, but you got to learn how to create good work. Right. Um, but a lot of it really comes from, uh, you know, and there's this theory between, you know, the, the order taker and the master chef, you know, you really want to make sure that you're that master chef and really guiding your clients to what they need in order to succeed. Because yeah. You're just doing like an order taking like, all right, you know, you want two cameras, you want a microphone, you know, you want two lights, you know, you want three minutes, you know, and if you're not aware that either what they're suggesting is wrong or not even aware of if they're wrong or if yeah. they're, you know, or if they're getting taken on a track or a path that's not going to work, you know, that's going to showcase, you know, once they actually get the video out there and if it doesn't work for whatever reason. Um, so yep. it's super important to be that master chef and just, you know, to become that advisor. And that's something that I've been doing a lot more in the last few years is really just trying to, you know, in, in a loving way, be like, you know, all right, you definitely don't want to do this and you right. definitely want to take this approach. Um, and of course, you know, you got to find a balance too as well. Yeah, you do. And from my own experience, um, and I can always only speak from my own experience, um, I also had to learn how not to invest too much time trying to convince that to those people too. Um, on one hand, you can come across as being desperate for their business. Um, we all want their business, we all need the business. And that's no doubt about that. But um, I have experience in the past where I invested months, months pursuing one client for the same thing and just wasn't getting anywhere. You know, there is a sell cycle. We all know what the sell cycle looks like for the most part. Um, most people who understand the sell cycle know that it's an eight point touch um, system. You know, you have to do follow-ups, you engage with them, you build that relationship with them, but you are always driving to the close. And I discovered that when I got to the point of the close part, I was stuck. And I was stuck for four months at a time. And there was a mistake somewhere in the beginning of the sales cycle that I would, I either missed or was 
I chose to overlook it because I was believing in the opportunity there for me with the person. But what it boiled down to was budget. These people either didn't have the money or they didn't want to spend the money. And um, I got to the point where I had to say, okay, I can only lead a horse to the water with my professional insight, but I can't force the horse to drink that water. So I've gotten to the point where I now turn around and I say, from a professional perspective, boom, 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 boom. This is the best way and approach for you. And every time they come to me, boom, 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 boom. From a professional perspective, this is the best approach that I recommend. This is the best approach that I recommend. And I say it a different way, in a polite and, mm -hmm. and professional way each and every single time. But I have to keep going because while I'm putting all that time into that one person like I did before, for four months after my cell cycle time frame, I am missing out on other opportunities where people do understand the value and see it. They see it and understand it and are ready to move forward. You know what I mean? Opportunity so, cost. That's super absolutely. important. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, these times are tough. And I was in a seminar that somebody else was hosting. And she was saying from a PR perspective, um, we want to be, oh, I'm sorry, it was a guy. He was saying, uh, we want to be sensitive to what people could be going through. Everybody's experience with this coronavirus is different. Everyone is handling their experience very differently. You know, my stress is different from what your stress is because of the way I receive it and digest it, and the same for you. Um, and um, he was saying, be, be conscious of what people could potentially be going through. And um, the question was, should we cut our costs down significantly just to be able to keep our business going and at the same time help those that are in need? And the, the response was no. It's a case by case situation. You can't put yourself in the red trying to help people. And you know, and you have to handle it on a case by case situation in the sense of knowing what you're able to give to them for free at no cost, knowing what you're able to do for them uh, at a reduced rate, and being flexible with the pay schedule or something like that. And the question is, can those individuals on the other side who are in need of your services understand that perspective or be willing to accept it and also at the same time see the value of what you've done for them and stuff so yeah it's tough. it is it is and you know i think that's going to be a, you know something that we're going to be juggling with for for a while um you know even through the summer you know we and, and even through the fall i mean you know, and, and even, you know, if, if there is a vaccine that gets, you know, delivered to people's doorsteps on, you know, September 1st or, you know, whatever it would be, um, you know, there's still going to be a, a pretty big reel in terms of, you know, people are trying to get back on their feet. And uh, yeah. it, it's so funny because, well, it's not funny, but like, it, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, you can build something up and it could be something so powerful. Yeah. But it only takes, you know, uh, it, it's very fragile. Um you know, what you build. And it's just something that, you know, we all have to just be aware to, to kind of not take it for granted. And, yeah. you know, I was taking a lot of things for granted in, you know, January and February. I mean, February was, you know, was my biggest month ever. And I was like, uh -huh. yeah, I, I was like, I think, you know, I think things are finally going the way they should. Not that they weren't uh -huh. going before, but like right. I was at- like it I felt, I was growing. Yeah, I, I, I was very much feeling at peace. Um, and then this happened, I was like, all right, well, you know, it's, it's time to really kind of um, get creative and, and, you know, just provide solutions. I mean, uh, last week I posted a LinkedIn article, from, you know, like seven, it was seven videos that schools can use. And really the whole purpose of it was a lot of it can be done themselves. And right. for me, I'm just like, you know what, 
if there is someone who wants me to kind of take care of that, then great. But for me, it's more or less providing the value of, of the ideas and the concepts. Um, you know, and if they want to tweak it up a bit, they certainly can. But for me, yeah. I'll be like, I'll be happy if someone says, oh my God, we loved your ideas. And, you know, we were able to, to use them for, you know, like the next month or so. Um, and what that does is, again, it goes back to the long haul, you know, they'll remember me for that. Um, you're the you guru. Know, you become, you yeah. become that expert in that field, in your field, mm -hmm. and viewed as the guru. So they're going to always keep looking for you for insight. And like you said earlier, at some point in time, they're going to get to the point where they're going to have a project that they can't do themselves and would come to the source that has educated them for uh, X amount of time. So you mentioned earlier that um, you don't care, you didn't want to go in the Hollywood direction with your, with your career. Uh, why is that? Uh, you know, it's interesting. And in hindsight, I'm so glad I made that decision to, to avoid that. Um, you know, I, I was on a couple sets, you know, just as like a production assistant. So kind of the lowest man on the totem pole. Uh -huh. and, I, and to be honest, you know, um, I think when you're in that, that area, it can be, um, it, 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 it's very cutthroat. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, you know, to me, I didn't feel it was as, as very welcoming as it could have been. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those things for me, I'm just like, well, why would I put myself through that if it's, you know, especially when, when movie productions and TV shows are starting to shrink um you know I, I mean right now they're on they're totally on pause you can't do anything yeah um so for me i was like you know why would i put myself through that um because to me it was just not i, I mean to me it, it just was no longer worth it um okay. 